Welcome to the GCI Conference Center. Please enter your access code, followed by the pound sign. Thank you. Please stand by. You will now be placed into conference. There are 17 participants in the conference. I just want you to know that my Marie Callender's chicken pot pies were not exactly satisfying. That's disappointing. It is. I mean, I like them, but I really wanted something else, but didn't have it in my house. So You just remind me I have one of the frozen pies in my fridge that I've been avoiding because I just don't need to be eating that, but they are <laughs> yummy. <laughs> well, you know, they talk about the freshman 15. I hate to determine what my... Uh, 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 hunkered down uh, pounds will be. Yeah. I think we're all going to come out of this 10 pounds heavier and with awful hair. <laughs> that could be. Yes. I had to cancel a hair cut reservation about four days before they closed all the barbershops. So. Uh, I wish I had thought to do that. But... <clears throat> yeah. Uh, oh, well. Mr. DeShook, are you online yet? I am online. Okay. Uh, Ms. Wilson, are you online? Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, reconvene the uh, Marijuana Control Board. Uh, it is uh, 1 o'clock on the 3rd of April. Uh, Mr. Clinkard, are we recording? Carrie, can you confirm? We are recording. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, again, we reconvening at 1 p.m. on the 3rd of April, 2020. Uh, we are all done with all of our applications uh, with the exception of two. Uh, we had um, a uh, operating plan change uh, for Northern Lights Cultivation, uh, license one, two, 173. Um, is anybody from Northern Lights Cultivation online? Okay, um, Mr. Klinkhart, uh on my agenda, it states that this was a, a M15 uh, operating plan change. It does not indicate whether or not it had been temporarily uh, approved, um, and um, it does say temporarily approved. Um, so, can you describe to us what the changes that you approved were? I guess we need to decide since this applicant was not at the January meeting and these were temporarily approved, whether this board wishes to continue that temporary approval, which means the applicant is already operating on it, um, or uh, whether we suspend that and notify them immediately of the suspension, um, which, uh, which for I'm, I'm sorry, which, facility, which tab is uh, license number 12173, tab 45. Okay, thank you. And so this is the second meeting in which a temporary approved uh, change that the applicant was not at the meeting. So being temporarily approved, that means this applicant has been operating uh, on this change since before January, uh, but has not been at our meetings. And we need to confirm the temporary or we need to uh, deny the temporary. Um, so I'm wanting to know what the will of the board is given that this applicant is not present. This is Jaime. I'm I'm more willing to actually suspend his license until he until he presents himself in front of the board. You know, this is supposed to be a professional, uh, not organization, but prof it's a profession, and they need to act like professionals. And unfortunately, this individual is not right now. So I'm leaning towards suspension. Okay, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, question, Mr. Schulte. 
Um, so what, uh, I, I don't disagree at all with what Mr. Rami just said. I, my question, uh, perhaps for uh, the director, is does he understand that they have temporary approval pending board approval? I mean, do they understand they're supposed to be here? Mr. Clickhart. Yes, it's my understanding uh, that they do know that and that uh, the staff lets them know that when something is temporarily approved that they have that, but they still need to be there. I'm sure Kerry can uh, interject uh, as well. Ms. Craig. Yes, uh, that is true. They have been notified and they were also notified earlier today uh, when, they, when we first called for them. Um, and they do know that this is a temporary approval. Okay. Ms. So, um, uh, the John Wilson. Yes, Ms. Wilson. The chair. Um, I'd ask the board to review 3 AAC 306810 and determine on what grounds it's moving to the center of the license. I don't know that we want to revoke the license. I think we may want to revoke the change to their operating plan. Uh, okay. I wasn't proposing that we suspend their license at all. Ah. Um, and uh, I, I was trying to determine if I look at the M15 uh, section two, it says we will build a wall in our vegetative room to create another flower room. We would like to top feed hydroponics as it looks to be more profitable. The nutrients we will use is the botanic care line. We're also changing our disposal method to mixing 50-50 mix of paper and wood and or wood chips to take the waste to the facility and catch can. So um, I assume if with the temporary approval, they have moved the wall, uh, they are doing the hydroponics. Uh, I don't know what uh, suspension of that approval would mean. Um, uh, so I was looking for some direction. I was not, I was not talking about suspending the entire license because this is a cultivation facility. But I am okay. concerned about the fact that they are, are, are ignoring the board uh, and the need to be here. Excuse me, hello. Hi, this is Hello? Liza Martin. This is Liza Martin from AKO Farms. Yes. Uh, I just couldn't get through. Um, is so, it, this is AKO Farms. It is. Mm -hmm. uh, we we approved those changes this morning. Okay. So Justin Brown was on, and we did approve the changes. Oh, okay. So are we talking about AKO right now? Uh, no, we're not. We're talking about Northern Lights Cultivation and Catch Can. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, at least they were paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> I, think the, I think the problem we have is on the updated, on the updated agenda that went out to the public. It's tab 44. Okay. Mr. Jones, I think you said tab 45, which is AKO Farms. Okay. Well, all right. And, well, and depending on, on, on my, on, yeah, on, on my uh, agenda, it is. But we are talking about license 12173, Northern Life Cultivation. So is there, um, we want to postpone this till June. Uh, do well, we want to... Uh, take some action today, uh, and what would that action be, Mr. Chairman? If I if I may, just, Mr. Schultz, uh, propose a. Uh, I guess I'm just sort of thinking out loud here. I, uh, like I said, I, I don't disagree at all with Mr. Jaime's comments. Um, I, I don't know why they're not here. I, obviously, I can't speak for them. Um, perhaps it would be appropriate to you know send them a certified letter and say, look, you know, you were expected. To come before the board twice, and you know, showed um, if you're if you're not there in June, we're we're going you know consider the temporary changes um, revoked. So, you is, know, that, is, that that a, is that a motion, Mr. Schulte? I, I will make that motion. 
Well, uh, can we discuss okay. it a little bit before we do a motion? Because you, you said in our next meeting in June, but it's already been two meetings that they have the president. And we have to have some teeth behind this board. I mean, if they, people keep ignoring us, why wouldn't everybody ignore us if we just keep pushing dates further down the line? I, I agree. And, and I would suggest we, we probably should have taken this step at the January meeting, honestly. And, and maybe that's the precedent we should look for in the future. I'm just thinking out loud here. No, no, and I agree. Okay. I mean, we're all we're, we're breaking new ground here. So, yeah, yeah, and it's it is kind of a new thing. I, mean, I on the one hand, you know, the folks have been given the flexibility of getting temporary approvals, which I think is a very positive thing. But you know, then they they do have to take responsibility for following up on that with the board. And I I understand they're probably busy, and you know, who knows what they're dealing with, you know, in their personal and professional lives today. But, you know, if they could, you know, they, they need to take a half hour or so out of their day and deal with this because it is, like Mr. Rimey said, this is a profession and uh, it's a highly regulated one and they, they kind of need to engage. And I believe Carrie mentioned that uh, she has documented how many times or how they have been contacted. Can you uh, expound on that a little bit? Sure. Um, we do send out a notification emails um, to the licensees to let them know like that they are being considered at this meeting. Uh, generally, that's you know anywhere from like two to one week before the meeting. Um, and then also earlier today, um, we sent out. I had staff sent out um, an email to all the um, applicants who weren't originally present. And most of them showed back up, but yeah, this one did not. And do you send those emails the way you send emails to us as far as like uh, a return receipt, like they actually opened it? I would have to double check on that. I'm not sure if they do, um, if they have a return receipt or not. I would have to look. <laughs> okay. That might be something to start in the future. Yeah, I believe in part of our uh, regulations, we, uh, when they apply, they agree that the official contacts will be via email. Uh, that's to somewhat uh, get past the idea that things would be in letter, whether they were certified or not. Uh, so they agree that the, the official contact uh, process is via email. So they should be aware when they apply that they need to pay attention to their emails and uh, respond as if that is the official notice. So, um, so Mr. Chair? I think, Ms. Yeah, Mr. Scholey. Uh, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add a footnote to that. So, so my, my business is IT services, and I, I deal, deal with email servers all the time, and it's, it's a changing media. Um, emails that might come through successfully today may not next week. Or a month later, it really depends on the on the uh, who's managing the server that they're using. Um, there's real problems with uh, Microsoft hosted email, and I think with either Yahoo or Gmail, maybe even both, back in December and January, because they changed the manner in which they filter for spam. So it's possible. I mean, I'm not making excuses for them, but it's it's possible that the emails simply went to their junk folder. Um, now that that's not necessarily an excuse, but yeah, yeah, I'm done. No, I realize that, and that's at least on mine. It identifies how much I have every time I open, how much I mail I have in a junk folder, and I need to go check it. So, yeah. um, you know, that's something I do every day. And there are uh, times when I get mass mailings from whatever organizations, uh, and sometimes those get thrown into junk, and sometimes they don't. Yeah. Some I wish would get thrown into junk, and then I could just get rid of them. <laughs> Through the chair. Um, uh, Mr. Miller. Um, you know, I would like to make one comment, uh, and I think we've had this discussion in the past that I, I don't believe our regulations require anyone to appear before the board. We've highly recommended it, but I, I want to be cautious here. Um yeah, it'd be nice to talk to everybody who comes in, but for a very simple, and, I, and I'm just throwing this out there for thought and comment, right? For a very simple change that doesn't need much explanation, 
that the director has already approved, given temporary approval for, you know, to, to deny someone's change just because they didn't show up to a board meeting when I don't believe <coughs> it's required, I, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Just putting it out there, and it's probably we need to have a discussion about it at a different time when we do have more time. And if, okay. if the board feels that strongly about it, then we should put it in the regulation that if, if an applicant has something to come before the board, they will appear. Uh, just my thoughts. Uh, Neil, this time, I completely agree with everything Mr. Miller said. I, I truly do, especially these minor changes. Uh, but that, then that leads me to say that maybe we shouldn't allow the director to make temporary changes and everybody should come before us because we, as a board, should have the final determination on these approvals. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I, right, I agree so, with both um, of you. <laughs> <laughs> he's right and no, he's I'm, right. Yeah, you sound like yeah, a line from Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> they're all valid points, um, and you know, I, I understand. kind of new ground. So um, we, uh, Mr. Scholey, uh, made a motion uh, that we send Northern Lights Cultivation to a certified letter stating that um, they have a, had a temporary approval. Uh, they were not at the. January meeting and they did not appear at the April meeting and that if uh, they want to avoid having their temporary approval rescinded, they need to be at the June meeting and send that via a certified letter. Um, is there a second to that motion? I'll second that, Jaime. Okay, that's seconded. Um, is there any further discussion? Okay, hearing none. Oh, yes. Well, I, after after all of this discussion, I was I was actually going to with, withdraw the motion, but uh, okay. since it's been made and second, I'll probably vote against it because I, I, I I'm going to suggest it. You can certainly approach. withdraw it before the vote. I I would like to withdraw it. Okay. And is that okay with I, the second? Yes, it is. So, okay. if, if I may, Mr. Chairman? Um, you may, Mr. Schulte. I, I Like I said, I, I agree with Mr. Jaime's concerns. I, I, I get what Mr. Miller is saying, and maybe we need to, we, we either need to make, make it very clear um, that we expect them to, sh expect folks to show up after the fact for, for all of these changes, or we need to articulate some threshold where they don't need to. You know, if it's, if it's something really simple, like they're going to, you know, change their nutrients or change the growing media, something, well, whatever we decide is a reasonably innocuous change versus uh, a, a major change in their operations uh, that, that could impact the public or, or, you know, the products they're producing. I, I don't know. Right, at the moment, I'm not prepared to suggest what that threshold would be, but... Um, you know, if we are going to ask people to come and, you know, spend the time, I feel like we, they sh there should be some value in doing that other than just showing up because we want them to. Okay. Uh, just to move this along, I think uh, all those points are valid in terms of what we might do in the future. It has been our precedent not to act um, on these without... Um, the applicant present. Uh, so uh, in light of that, in absence of any other changes, uh, we will simply move this to the June meeting and ask staff to uh, contact them uh, to their normal process. Uh, and maybe when we get uh, to the next item after the uh, last uh, application, then we can uh, discuss whether or not we want to make uh, those changes, uh, and then we can get those communicated. So um, given what we have done in the past, uh, we'll just move this to the June meeting. Uh, the next one on my agenda is tab 52, but is license 17445, two birds, one stoned. And this is, again, an operating plan change. Is there anybody online from two birds, one stoned? OK, 
Okay, I do not hear anybody online from two birds, one stoned. Um, and this was temporarily approved change. Uh, just the overall square footage of the area will be 358 square foot. The dimensions of the cultivation are 24 foot, 2 inches by 14 feet, uh, 10 inches. Um, and nobody's on the line. This has been temporarily approved. Uh, so we will again move this to the June meeting uh, with the normal communications. And that may change after we've had some discussion about uh, regulations or process as we uh, are moving forward. Okay, you know, so. This is Jaime, really fast. I think that this could yeah. be a simple, a simple fix just with the director uh, pass along the intent that with these temporary changes, they are expected just with intent. If we can't uh, mandate them to just that uh, is the intent of the board that they come before the board and explain the changes in case we have questions. So that um, can just be simply I, I think, on board I think we by. can. It might require a, a regulation change to, to make it mandatory. Uh, but uh, I think that the director will certainly uh, uh, do that if, and maybe go beyond what's, what has been done in the past to let them know. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we are basically done with all of the application issues uh, that are before us. Um, and we are on to the last page, uh, at least on my agenda. And we're talking about, and I want to frame this this way. We're talking about proposed regulations and board requests. I would like to delay that. Uh, then there is Below that, consideration of emergency delegation authority, I think we can put all of that into uh, one uh, set of discussions as long as we sort of discipline ourselves to one topic at a time. Uh, so um, is there any, um, we have two regulations and we can either put those off or we can deal with them today. Uh, what is the preference of the board? Mr. Chairman, I, I would move that we table the regulations Till June. Okay. Till the June meeting. Is there a uh, second? And this, this is high me. This is high. Oh, I guess I can. I'll second it for discussion. I guess. Okay. Yeah, you know, I, I don't mind tabling this until the June meeting, but we need to make decisions on these. We just seem to keep pushing, uh, especially when it comes to regulation changes or proposals. We push them, and then we have you know the public comments uh, section, and and every every meeting we just keep pushing these further and further out and nothing gets accomplished. And I know with five individuals, uh, strong personalities, we all have strong personalities, uh, they're hard to agree on as it is, so if we just keep delaying the, the inevitable, it's, it's not accomplishing anything in my mind. Okay. Any other discussion on the motion? Okay, hearing no more discussion, the motion is to move the uh, regulations project sales limits and quality control sampling and exit packaging to the June meeting. Uh, Mr. Deschuk? No. Mr. Heine? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Schulte? Yes. And I'm a yes. Okay, so those are moved. Uh, so, I want to, in fairness to all, um, we have um, an item called consideration for uh, delegation of authority that has come from uh, the director. And I'm trying to see if um, there is a memo in our file Through the chair. from uh, Mr. Miller. Uh, before we get too deep into this, were we going to? Did we have something to deal with on uh, Danish Gardens Tab Thirty Seven? Um, that was a uh, uh, a license renewal, and uh, they had not been at the uh, meeting. So, and I don't think they were earlier. So, uh, yes. Probably it's one that I have not gone back to, Mr. Miller. Uh, thank you. Um, 
Uh, mine is tab 38, but it's Danish Gardens, license 10310. Uh, and this is a uh, license renewal application. And the licensee was not present in January. And so I would ask is anybody representing Danish Gardens online at this meeting? Okay, hearing none, um, what's the will of the body? I'm assuming okay, they'll get a notice they'll get a notice in May for their renewal when they're uh, for next year. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. When, when Chairman, was their license last renewed? Uh, Ms. Craig, could you answer that? I do not have that information right in front of me at this time. Okay. I would have to assume that they were approved up through uh, July 1 or August 31 of 19 that they submitted an application for renewal. Uh, that application then came to the board uh, because of the our policy that renewals get to the board for because of NOVs, uh, and uh, so they have a renewal, temporary renewal from staff pending board action, and this is the second meeting in which we've done that. Uh, so uh, they are licensed uh, temporarily this year, uh, but we're coming up on the renewal period for those licensed in 2020. Uh, so I assume in May they'll be noticed again uh, and having operated most of this year on a temporary approval. To the chair, I do want to point out that um, this goes back to the November meeting um, is when I believe this originally um, came up and they were not present at the November meeting um, and they also were not present at January meeting. And we do have... Um, a history of notifying them, and there was a uh, conversation between staff and, um, or there was a voicemail left by the licensee um, that staff responded to via email, um, which was the day before the board meeting, but they still were not present, even though they were encouraged to do so. Okay. Well, what's, what's, what's curious, I, I'm kind of wondering, well, I'm wondering, A, have they, have they paid their taxes? Isn't that in the state? Broke? And, and broke. yeah, I'm wondering if they paid their taxes and if they're, if they're even still in business. Because I, I recall one of the licensees going on the local news and saying that they were not being successful and they were going to close their doors. So I'm kind of left here wondering, like, are we just perpetuating a license that isn't even being exercised? I, and I don't Mr. know. Mr. Plinkhardt or Ms. Craig, do you have an answer or speculation? Uh, this is Director Clinkard. I can say that they have continued to not pay their taxes. And at this point, I am um, leaning towards uh, sending a couple enforcement officers to confirm the physical location and the status of their operations and report back to the board. Over. It is shut down and for sale. <laughs> Uh, somebody's Chair, talking and you're not part of the board, so if you could mute your phone, please. Uh, Mr. Well, Mr. Hyman. Chairman, I guess. Oh, I thought I heard Mr. Jaime. Mr. Schulte. Okay. Um, I, I would welcome that, that feedback for, uh, for, from the director so we could have some idea of you know, how, how to proceed. Because um, if, if indeed they, they owe the state taxes that they're not paying, that's a big issue. Maybe it's the biggest yeah. issue. Um, but if they're if they're actually not growing anymore, well, well, I guess no. I, I I I agree with you. But I think a check of metric to see if they've tagged any new plants in the recent uh, time period, if they've uh, sold product, uh, that would be in metric, and we could we could know when the last transaction was in metric 
uh, would give us some indication, but uh, sending a couple of uh, enforcement staff out there to verify in person and to reiterate to the owner uh, their need to come before the board uh, is important. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I guess I would uh, ask the director to uh, do what actions he deems necessary to determine if this uh, program is still, uh, business is still operating and still uh, growing under their temporary license. And if the director feels there's a necessity uh, to uh, call a special meeting to deal with this, depending on what he finds, uh, that he could contact uh, me and we will try to uh, set up a special meeting to deal with this. Uh, if they're not operating, then we, we may have a different type of meeting to do. But uh, is, is that acceptable to you, Mr. Klinkhardt and Mr. Ms. Wilson? Yes, thank you. Yes, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, is that uh, okay, Mr. Miller, and with the rest of the board? Uh, yes, definitely okay with me. I was just... Um, I remember November and January, so I was just trying to figure out where we are. So. Okay. All right. So that takes care of Danish Gardens today. And thank you, Mr. Miller, for reminding me that that is one I have skipped. Um, so um, we have the consideration of emergency delegation and authority. Uh, uh, Mr. Klinkhart, there is on tab my tab 65, um, the uh, memo from you uh, about the delegation. If, uh, if you could explain a little bit uh, in depth what you're looking at uh, and then maybe have uh, Ms. Wilson uh, let us know what she thinks uh, we have authority normally and maybe authority under uh, some emergency uh, uh, proclamations that the governor has done. So, Mr. Klinkhart, uh, we will go to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, this is really just for your consideration and discussion. Um, one of the things that we've been doing, of course, during this uh, time has been planning for the worst, and I just wanted to make sure that as part of my planning that the board considered worst-case scenarios or things that they could potentially help um, speed things along or being able to make decisions uh, quickly or just Maybe not. Uh, the idea here is to, for you to talk about if there's anything that my, that my staff and I can be able to do without having to um, call upon, or in the case where the board cannot meet uh, for whatever reason, I would hope, hate to think any of you get sick. Um, so I just want to open that up for discussion, and I, uh, I don't have an opinion or anything specific if you're asking for specific things I'm asking for, because I'm really not. I just wanted to make sure we had that discussion and the board felt comfortable either way. Over. Okay. Uh, Ms. Wilson, uh, could you... Hello? Sure. Uh, who's, uh, who's this? This is Lawrence Bento with Two Birds, One Stone. I think I may have missed something uh, earlier. I just phoned <laughs> in. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, with the board's permission, can we go back? <clears throat> okay. I'm good with that. Um, I mean. All right. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so we will go back to my tab 52. Um, and uh, it is uh, two birds, one stoned. And this is an operating plan change uh, that has been temporarily approved. And um, our the process is that uh, uh, the board won't take action unless the person is there. Uh, so your name again, please. It's Lawrence Bento. Okay. And you are one of the owners? Yes, I'm the sole owner. Sole owner. Okay. Uh, so we, we did have a motion on the floor to approve uh, the requested change and the requested change is change the overall square footage of cultivation to 358 square feet. Uh, are there any questions of the applicant? 
Um, I do yeah. not believe I have any questions. No, oh, I was okay. asking the board if they had questions of uh, you. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, uh, being Mr. on the telephone, I'm miscommunicating quite a bit today. So, Mr. Schulte. Yeah, just a question for, for the licensee. Um, so, if, uh, if, should we understand that your the facility is unchanged? Are you just changing the, the distribution of your, your growing trays? or uh, uh, Essentially, you... Mr. Schulte, yes. Uh, what had happened was there was walls before. Um, it was uh, separated with just some walls, and I just simply took out the walls. Okay. So it's it's the same. It's the same facility. Nothing's actually changed. The square footage changed because the walls essentially took up a minimal amount of square footage, and then once that all disappeared, it's the footprint changed, but it's the same space. Okay. So in the, okay. In the original. Okay, I see. The original operating plan says. The cultivation will be split into two rooms, but you're saying that Correct. the wall that, that achieved that has been removed, so now you just have one room? Correct. Okay. Uh, wait, are you doing veg and flower both in one room? Um, so I have a veg rack um, that's uh -huh. just covered with plastic in the same room. So uh -huh. it's, it's, not, it's not an actual room, it's just a rack, and uh, it's in the same room. Correct. So, okay. How are you, are you growing auto flowers, or how are you... Uh, how are you managing so your light? The, the rack has a, um, it's similar to a tent style, so there's just a, a plastic that comes down over the rack to achieve the light deprivation, and then it just comes up when I'm actually working on it. But it's just, a, it's, I guess, similar to just what a tent would be inside of the room. Oh, okay. Okay. I was just trying to understand how you were managing the different light cycles there. Okay. Right. It's a really small space, so I'm just trying to, Maximize everything 100 percent. Sure. Okay. I, I have no more questions, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So on the motion to approve the uh, operating plan change for two birds, one stone, one license, uh, license number one seven four four five. Mr. Deshook. Yes. Mr. Jaime. Yes. Mr. Schulte? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. And I'm a yes. So uh, thank you, Mr. Bento, and uh, good luck. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you. Hello. Yes, hello. Hey there. Uh, you have one more straggler, um, Northern Who's Lights that? Cultivation 2, tab 44. Oh. Okay. With board oh, yeah. permission, we will go back to Northern Lights Cultivation. Okay. 44 or 45? Uh, 44. Well, uh, it's 45 on yours and mine and 44 on others because apparently oh. some of us downloaded the adjusted mem uh, minutes and some of us didn't <laughs> our agenda. Uh, and I'm one of those that did not apparently. Um, so we have uh, Northern Lights Cultivation, um, and this is an operating plan change that had been temporarily approved. Um, and so online we have who? Who is online? Jacob Rodriguez. Jacob Rodriguez. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, are there questions uh, from the board to Mr. Rodriguez? Uh, on the uh, plan changes. It sounds like you, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Schulte. I'm Mr. Schulte. Um, so it sounds like you're changing the configuration a little bit, split, uh, creating an extra room, and yep. changing your disposal method, your waste disposal method. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, any other questions from the board to the applicant? Okay, no. hearing none. Um, on the motion to approve the operating plan changes for Northern Lights Cultivation 2, license 12173, 
Uh, Mr. Deshook? Yes. Mr. Jaime? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Schulte? Yes. And I'm a yes. Uh, thank you much for calling in. Uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there any other stragglers online before I try to move us on to, I uh, think, other topics that might be of interest to the industry? Okay, so hearing none, uh, I was asking Ms. Wilson if she could uh, let us know what uh, we might be able to delegate to uh, the director, uh, what uh, other changes we might be able to make uh, due to uh, any emergency uh, ability we might have given the uh, uh, mandates and uh, orders from uh, the governor. Uh, very good, sir. May I, may I add just one preface to you those may. two questions responses? Uh, the first is that when the director and I were discussing whether he required any additional authority, we really had no idea how well the board meetings were going to go. Um, we, we thought we made the same request of both the ABC board for you to talk about it and of your board as well. So I add, unless Director Klinkhardt can think of another situation, you know, I, we may not need this delegation. Um, unless things get much worse than what we're facing here in the state. But as to what you could delegate, seven, Statute 1738-150 um, provides the director's current authority, um, and it's generally an authority to, you know, to act at your behest, um, and that any approval he gives is, is um, not binding upon the board. There is a last sentence that says the board may delegate to the director any duty imposed by this chapter except its power to propose and adopt regulations. And then if you went back to the powers and duties of the board and 121, we would just go through each list and see if there's anything you thought the um, it might behoove the director to have. But with my process there, do you even want to have that discussion? After that, I do want to tell you, uh, I want to just convey to you what's happening with the emergency declaration and how the alcohol board um, addressed some of its laws that um, the industry wanted some uh, repose from. But maybe I can just end this inquiry on, on emergency powers and, and wait and hear what you'd like or what you think. Okay. Um, I, I uh, I I agree with you. I think that uh, as far as uh, meetings and granting other delegated authority, I think we're still okay. I do think, and and maybe other board members would disagree, but I think of concern to some of the members um, have been the requests that have come from the uh, Marijuana Industry Association uh, related to. Uh, some issues that I think have been exacerbated by some of the mandates. And I think we need to understand how we can proceed in that way. But I will back up and state, uh, is there any uh, board member who wishes to uh, have the discussion about whether we want to look at the list in 1738, uh, 121? to determine if any of those we want to delegate or would we rather pass over those and just begin our discussion about uh, potential uh, regulatory changes to help the uh, marijuana industry this COVID-19. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Schulte. Mr. Schulte. Um, wh while I'm looking up uh, the referenced regulation in 1738, I, I would be interested in hearing what the alcohol board did because they're, they're facing some similar problems, although their regulatory process is different. Mr. Chair, um, they did not delegate any additional authority 
to the director. I, I will go out. I can, though, address what requests they made of the governor um, to uh, ease some of the burden on the industry. But I'll do that whenever. I, I'm, and I'm and, and if, I think, I, if I think those requests were because a lot of the alcohol authority is, is in the statute as opposed to regulation. Mm -hmm. Well, no, there's an actual statute about the governor's authority that applies to regulations uh, as well. So I, that's okay. what I would apprise you of. Okay. Uh, so maybe you could do that and that'll help us a little bit. And, and the item through the chair. Mr. Miller. And the items that are in the memo are the exact same items that are in 1738-150 based on my read of it, right? So, Mr. Schulte, there's no reason to go look it up if you have the memo. Oh, okay. I do have the memo. Yeah. I, thanks. And Mr. Jones, is this the time Mr. to Miller. discuss my thoughts on uh, I, was, uh, I think Mr. Scholey had asked a question about what did the alcohol board do, and I think Ms. Wilson okay. was going to explain that. Um, so, Ms. Wilson. All right. The alcohol board, just to cut to the chase, um, took an advisory vote to request the governor to suspend um, prohibitions on restaurants and breweries of entities that have only the ability to serve alcohol on their premises to permit off premises. So in essence, what they did was uh, permit initially people to, when they're picking up their orders of pizza or whatnot to get a bottle of wine along with that. They also permitted liquor stores to allow that same curbside pickup. Um, next Wednesday, they are holding an additional meeting to address whether to uh, whether to make a request of the governor regarding home deliveries, but they put that off until oh. another. So the reason they did it that way, and the reason I I think emergency regulations, we can discuss what. Uh, excuse me, there's somebody on the line who is having an argument with somebody else. Would you please mute your phone? Thank you. Is that many of our laws, when it comes to enforcement of our laws, involve both civil and criminal liability. And no matter what we do here as a board, if licensees can be exposed to criminal liability for their actions, um, it, it doesn't behoove us to work in my opinion, without working with the Department of Law and the governor's office. And under the Governor's Emergency Powers Act, the governor has a number of initial authorities, but he may suspend the provisions of any regulatory statute prescri prescribing procedures for the conduct of state business or the orders or regulations of any state agency if compliance with the provisions of the statute order or regulation would prevent or substantially impede or delay action necessary to cope with the disaster emergency. So by way of the um, curbside delivery, individuals from the industry testifying, we're, we're talking about increasing safety, not only for the consumer, but for the salesperson of a, let's say a liquor store that their, their interaction would be limited and the consumer would not have to go into the store. And um, after they took that advisory vote, I'm still in the process of moving that um, up through the Department of Law to the governor's office, who will address, when he addresses public health mandates, may expand or, as the board directs. I, I don't currently know the current status of that. But so one thing we might consider is under this authority, if there's some statute or regulation, the compliance of which you think would make it difficult to cope with this disaster emergency, you can take an advisory vote and request the governor to suspend those. Uh, we can also look through each of your regulations and determine if you also want to uh, try to issue emergency regulations. 
the question with that is we have to make sure in doing that we're also not exposing the licensees to criminal liability because their jurisdiction is primarily civil through license action. Okay. Did I raise too uh, many questions? I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, not for me. That would have been what I was thinking. But uh, uh, any uh, board questions of Ms. Wilson at this point? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I have a couple. Mr. So, so uh, thank you. Um, so kind of going back to some of the comments yesterday from the uh, AMIA uh, president, there's a, uh, it seems like there's a couple of things potentially we could do to help these businesses and, you know, Deal, deal, you know, operates effectively under the current social, uh, circumstances. Um, but my question for Ms. Wilson is if, if these things would be, uh, are things we could do. So, so the first one would be allowing for um, curbside pickup, um, perhaps with a stipulation that, that the transaction you know, had to be conducted within view of their security cameras so that we maintain a record of the transaction. Um, cause obviously we don't want them, we don't want teenagers taking advantage of, advantage of this to pull up and buy some weed and drive off. Um, would something like that be, uh, uh, achievable? I mean, is that something we could do in the form of an emergency regulation? Um, yes. So the ABC board, considered, I don't think they got to the point of doing emergency regulations. Maybe that'll be a subject they address next Friday. But for example, they wanted to make sure that if someone delivered alcohol to someone's car, they made sure the per car, they made sure the person who was in the car, one was of age and two was not restricted from receiving it. And in their thinking, they were going to require that individual to have a tax card. Um, so they could also assess you know, whether they were drunk, under the influence, et cetera. So one way to do that is, I think just as you're saying, um, ask, I, maybe it's twofold, tell the governor which laws you would, laws or regulations you would like to suspend as a period of the emergency and then develop through emergency regulations how you would nevertheless protect the public. And everything you just mentioned there protects the pu protects the public and minors especially. Okay. Well, Bass, this is Jaime. I, I, are we getting ahead of uh, ahead of ourselves? The bars are closed to the public; they can't go in right now. So that's why they want to do this curbside. Uh, to my knowledge, the marijuana shops point. are still yeah. are still open. That is a fair point. Right. So I, I, but, but let me say the liquor stores are still open too. And they also requested this accommodation, um, and the ABC board voted for it as well. So I, I now, was that I just to, to show like that they were together on the same purpose, or was there a purpose behind it? I, I really I mean, think the was purpose, there a separate purpose. From what I understood from the industry was public safety that they wanted to limit the consumers having to go into the stores and to. Um, I guess protect the safety of the retail staff as well. So that was my. I, and opinion. I understand all those. Those are valid points. And, and public health, I'm, I'm huge on public safety, absolutely. But if you look at, let's say, Costco or these other businesses, they're enacting policies where they only allow you know a certain number of people in the building. So you know, based on the square footage of these marijuana shops, the business itself, they can say if they're really concerned about public health, they can say. Well, unless, uh, you know, only two people in that at a time, and that would negate us having to vote on any of this. And let's leave how regulations are, uh, or, or how they are now. Through the, through the chair, Mr. Uh, Miller. Mr. Miller. So, Mr. Jaime, um, the things you're talking about, I would say 100% uh, of the marijuana businesses has already done that. I, but I think what the industry is trying to do is to um, meet, the governor's health mandate, I think 11, that if you can make changes um, to better protect health and safety, then you should do that, right? And and that's what the industry is trying to do. Customers are asking for it. They don't want to come in. Um, employees are concerned. So if you can do something to better meet the health mandate that can be done safely and does extend the public health protections that are already in place, 
it would it would make sense that we would do them, and I think that's what the industry is asking for. It the would, chair- but the proposals that the industry asked for earlier aren't accomplishing any of those. They truly are not. I know, and I want to be a supporter of the industry, even as the public safety seat. I want to support the industry, and their proposals are just lacking the regulations. They are not protecting public health, public safety. They can do that, take that upon themselves, and in that you know, policies tailored to their businesses. Um, I, I understand that we are on the phone and we are having a discussion. I would still like uh, for persons who want to speak to be recognized through the chair so that uh, we're a little bit more organized and having an, an open discussion uh, around a round table, which we can't do, which I wish we could do because I, I find this topic interesting, but I would like to to do this. Um, so uh, I think that um, we, we sort of see the two sides. So one is uh, curbside pickup uh, has been talked about. Um, is there any um, discussion specifically on that that we could give, I guess, instructions to the attorneys to include in any request that we might formulate to Go to the governor. Uh, quick, uh, any discussion on that topic or other topics? No, I think just this topic. I'd like to keep it here because okay. I will. I will. I will just say that curbside pickup for alcohol may be different um, in that you need to verify that they're not impaired and you need to verify that they're twenty-one. Um, our regulations go a little bit beyond in that the purchase, the person purchasing the marijuana needs to be present. Uh, you cannot order over the internet. Uh, you can't sell over the internet. Uh, and so how would a marijuana business know who ordered what, either via the telephone or something and then they would package that. Uh, you cannot pay with a credit card, so there has to be a payment uh, scheme, uh, and then deliver it to a vehicle curbside or to a person standing outside, which is not much different than somebody standing inside, uh, and continue to verify that this is the person who actually ordered it, uh, that they aren't impaired, that they have the right ID. I. I I, 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 I raise those because I think not only would we, there are probably two or three different sets of or places in the regulations that the attorney would need to address to the governor uh, in their request in order to allow the curbside pickup. There's more than just uh, uh, delivery. And, and I think the, our rules are different enough from the alcohol rules uh, that we, we need to consider. But I'm not, uh, I'm not saying yes or no. I'm just saying if, if we want to explore this, this issue, then I think we need to be clear to the attorney that we would like to explore this, that we would like to have the governor suspend the rules or whatever. Um, otherwise, if we're going to do emergency regulations, we have to be really clear because then I think the attorney is going to have to draft those regulations uh, and then there is a process, so it's not immediate regulation. We do it today, and we walk out the door. It's uh, it's probably a process that might take us a week or a week and a half. So uh, I just want to talk about curbside pickup. Is that one that we continue to explore and uh, would ask the attorney to uh, look at all of those issues, and then we can move on. Uh, through, through the chair, chair this is – oh, go Mr. ahead, there, uh, Nick. Uh, Mr. Miller. Sorry, Mr. Jaime, I keep beating you. So are we doing, it doesn't feel like we're following the process under AS 4462-250 emergency regulations. So I just want to understand how we want to accomplish these. And that is to our counsel. Well, the, it's a twofold process. The, the first is to determine if you want to request the governor to suspend any regulation, which does not require an emergency um, 
declaration. I mean, it requires obviously the initial emergency declaration, but it does go through the level of review that emergency regulations go through. So that's one approach is to just say, is there, are there some sections in here that you'd like to suspend enforcement of both civilly and criminally? I, then I move it to the governor's office. The other approach is to say, we're going to do a combination of that. We're going to say what to suspend, but we're going to issue emergency regulations about what safety measures to put in place during that suspension. And that's something that I think, you know, just as the chair said, I would be drafting up why this is an emergency, why this is a public health need, why it needs to be done without public health, without public comment, et cetera, and move that separately through through the Department of Law, through the legal and regulation section. The third approach is to just decide, I, mean, it, I guess you as the, you can decide to suspend any civil enforcement of your requirements, meaning that their license will not be in, in jeopardy, and you can do that through emergency regulations, but is that a full solution for your licensee? If the Department of Law or the Criminal Division or other entities are concerned about curbside delivery of marijuana. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Miller, did that answer your question or do you have a follow up? Uh, you know, maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm still thinking about it. Um, okay. I know I had a big discussion with the criminal section regarding the initial request of the. Um, ABC board. And I, I understand that your requirements are more in regulation than in statute, but um, the criminal division is really not happy about things going through without um, kind of their review because from it, enforcement is an issue that is broader than the marijuana control board. And, and I'm definitely not trying to be difficult. I'm just trying to understand the, the emergency regulation section of uh, Mm -hmm. the Alaska statute and you know it doesn't talk about going through the criminal division or anything else so I'm trying to figure out how that fits with this section of the statute right I'd say you can whatever you civilly have the jurisdiction over you continue to have the jurisdiction over and you can suspend extend um, do what you believe is appropriate to respond to the public health emergency through, emerg through emergency regulations. Um, if you want to address the criminal portion, then you want me to take things uh, yeah. forward and request the governor to suspend them as well. Mr. Chair Casey? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, I kind of got skipped over here. Oh, uh, yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Amy. Uh, can I go to Mr. Jaime first? Uh, no, go ahead, go ahead and take him, because I need to ponder what uh, the attorney just said. So go ahead and take the... Uh, okay, the, Mr. Deshook. So my, the thing that I, I'm cautioning us about is we're, we're going through emergency to change a lot of these regulations. It's going to take a while to make sure that we get all of this put in place, and it's an important time. But on the back end of this, it's also going to be something that we have to consider how you how you roll any of this back. And I don't think it's going to be as easy to roll these things back as what we may be uh, viewing it. So acting quickly because of the emergency declaration may not be in, in our best interest regulating the industry. Mr. Chair? Emergency regulations um, terminate after 120 days from adoption unless the board votes to make them permanent and goes through all the other procedures of the Administrative Procedure Act. Can we tie those to the uh, health mandates? That's the big question. And, and the way to do that is, are you, let me take a step back. Are you doing this to provide a better financial op ability for the licensees to operate during this disaster or are you doing taking measures to protect public health 
the governor's power of, of suspen- suspension primarily because this is co- called a public health emergency is to suspend laws and regulations, the enforcement of which would impede public health. So if you want to fall under what I believe the governor has the authority to do, you want to fall on the public health end of that spectrum. It doesn't mean that your licensees don't have financial needs, and that's why they're coming to the board requesting accommodations. But I don't believe financial needs are are sufficient under our current declaration. If there were a financial declaration of emergency, I might argue otherwise, but I haven't seen that in place yet. Uh, through the chair, this is Jaime. Excuse me, I'm on, I was on mute, I was talking to you. Do you have any follow-up, Mr. Jaime? Uh, no real follow-up. I, I just think we're we're getting ahead of the, the game. I'm with kind of with Mr. Or I am with Mr. Deshu here. You know, think policy is always more difficult to roll back once they're out there because people will end up liking them, especially if it relaxes regulations. This is a public health issue. Uh, my personal recommendation is we just leave things how they are right now. We have been responsive to the industry, uh, and if things get a lot worse, then we can always have an emergency meeting in the future and. Uh, adjust as necessary. But as of right now, I, I don't think we need to, we're not getting ahead of the game, we're just going around the game. Uh, I just think we need to take a step back and let things settle, and if it gets worse, then we have emergency meeting and we can reassess. Re- uh, that's it. Mr. Chairman? Okay. Uh, Mr. Schultz? Uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with, with what Mr. Jaime said. I, I have a question actually for Mr. Miller. Um, so, I, the, the thing I'm wrestling with is, is Mr. Jaime's comment that you know, these, the retail stores are still open. They can still conduct business, but they have to really change up their, their, their processes, limiting how many people are in the building and, and, and so forth. It's super inconvenient, but they, but they can still conduct business. So I guess I'm just trying to gauge how, how urgent this is for the industry. And that as a retail store owner, I guess I'm, that's why I'm, Putting the question to you, I, I don't know how urgent is the health of our public and our employees. It's not convenient to send an employee out to the curb to deliver product to somebody. This is not a convenience measure. We have individuals, customers, and employees both who are concerned about their health. And if we can do something to better meet the health mandates, why wouldn't we do it? This is, I, I gotta be honest with you, it's inconvenient as hell, right? Because different stores are gonna implement things different ways, and it's not easier to have your employee outside the building by any means. It's not cheaper. We're not gonna charge for the curbside delivery. This is to keep separation in the public. And as an example at my shop, I allow three people in at a time. And people still are concerned about their health, including my employees and the public. I hear about it a dozen times a day. I had a customer come into my store, I think it was Monday, and we're standing there and they like the selection and we're talking. I said, next time I'll call and have you deliver. And I'm like, well, we can't deliver. It's against statute, right, regulations. Well, I had some delivered Saturday. And I'm like, okay, you probably did have some delivered Saturday, but it wasn't by a licensed marijuana establishment, and they had no clue. They thought what they did was perfectly legal. I can go to the Internet right now and call three or four places and have them deliver marijuana to my home. And they're not licensed. Consumers still don't understand. I I don't know. I mean, you can see I'm a little worked up. I have... You know, my employees are worried, I'm worried, our customers are worried, and if we can do something to better meet the health mandate, it just makes sense for me, it makes sense to me to do it. And I guess that's where I'm at. Sorry for the rant. No, no, that's why I'm the chair. Mr. Jaime. Yeah, and, and, you know, uh, Nick, I, I understand where you're coming from. I, I'm all about, you know, keeping people employed. There's a lot of people that are unemployed now. Just today, we went up to, what, 4.4%, 770,000 jobs lost last month. That's, uh, un- it's unfortunate for everybody. 
Uh, but, you know, if we sit here and try to pass these merchant regulations, I can see the governor just shutting down the businesses altogether because he doesn't like what we're passing. So we need to be aware of that as well. Uh, you yeah. know, and if employers are really that nervous or, or scared about their employees, which I am, I mean, I don't leave the house. My kids haven't left the house in two weeks. Uh, you know, you can all shut down the business. And uh, Ms., I, if, if I might interject here, I think that uh, uh, Mr. Miller is uh, rightly concerned. I know that the industry has uh, worked toward, uh, you know, providing that in terms of the number of employees. I think there's been some KTUU interviews uh, in a, at least one or two establishments in Anchorage about how they are social distancing. Uh, one of the health mandates uh, talks about if you are a non-essential business, uh, you can still operate if you can provide the six-foot physical distancing uh, and still run your business. Uh, for many retail shops, not marijuana shops, retail shops, um, that's almost impossible. Um, and so we have had souvenir shops, uh, T-shirt shops, clothing shops, basically shut down because there's no way they could have a transaction between a customer and a service provider maintaining that distance given the products that they deliver. Um, and so, um, uh, but in that list, in that health mandate that talks about uh, if you're not an essential business, you must close, uh, there is definitions. Uh, Costco, grocery stores, are by definition essential services. Uh, uh, in the list the city and borough Juno had in our mandate before it was superseded by the governor, uh, marijuana industry was an essential service. It is not on the list put out by the governor's office. Um, and so uh, they're still open. I think, uh, so whether we do curbside pickup or not, I think maybe we could explore some of those issues. I think one of the more urgent uh, issues, uh, especially for Southeast, and uh, I think probably for Mr. Miller's business out in Bethel, um, is transport. Um, we now are down from 12 flights a day with Alaska Airlines to Juneau to seven. Uh, we have... Uh, today, I've seen in the Anchorage paper where Raven Air has basically decreased their service by 90%. How many uh, two days ago, uh, well, last night, we had a report from our emergency operations center, and Juno had 35 arriving passengers yesterday uh, from all of the airlines or whatever that uh, enter into our airport. Uh, that's down from probably close to 800 a day. Um, and, and I think for the industry that has product that needs to go from Anchorage or Fairbanks to Southeast or vice versa or to Bethel, uh, basically the governor has said in the travel mandate that if you're not providing an essential service, uh, you shouldn't be traveling. Uh, and I think some of the issues that I know Mr. Miller will raise and I I'm sorry to jump the gun on you, but that the industry is looking at is how can we help them uh, with the transport uh, given this situation? Uh, but I think we run up against some rules with uh, uh, feds in terms of uh, cargo or airline or uh, whatever. Uh, but I think we also need to discuss that. I think that may be as important to the industry as the curbside. Um, and it may not be as much for uh, Anchorage and, uh, and Matsu and Fairbanks being on the road system or the Kenai, but certainly for Utiavik, which we just approved, Cottsview, Nome, uh, Southeast Alaska, uh, that's, some, that's some pretty heavy issues. And um, I know that there's some idea of, of can we allow Gold Street, can we allow uh, product to go with a manifest in cargo? And I... I don't know the answers to all of those, um, but I think um, not to pass over the curbside pickup, uh, but there may be uh, uh, 
a better way that we can um, deal with this. And maybe Ms. Wilson can say whether or not we can request of the governor those rules change when it involves transportation on federally regulated uh, carriers, I guess. Um, I and don't think he has that jurisdiction, Mr. Chair. He might be able to request it of the president. Through the chair. Mr. Miller. I, I, I'm not asking, or I don't think the industry is asking that um, the board approve us to transport marijuana on any airline. I think what we're asking for is approval to transfer product through a carrier like you would several items, right? Like they do, like it said in the testimony, evidence. Um, if there's a charter company that is flying to, I'll use Bethel as an example because I go there, and they accept my shipment, I want to be able to do that. There are air carriers, smaller charter companies, who will accept it, but by regulation, we can't do it. So I just want to make sure that we don't hamstring ourselves because we think we're requiring a company like Alaska Airlines to transport anything for us. We're asking for the ability to use carriers in, in general. So. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I may have gotten a little carried away, but uh, for Southeast, uh, I'm not sure we have that. Uh, Ms. Wilson. If it's of any... Um convenience to you, what the alcohol board did was, you know, come up with some advisory votes, but they still wanted to address matters further. So they scheduled an emergency meeting for next week. And if you gave me assignments, that would give me time to try to get some answers for you for some of those questions. So I just want to throw that out as an idea, if, if we can accomplish everything in the next hour, two hours and 45 minutes. <laughs> Well, I was, I was hoping Through to be a chair, little a quicker quick than that today. Uh, Mr. Jaime, is that you? Yes, I just have a quick question uh, for, I'm guessing, you and Nick, actually, and uh, Mr. Schulte. You know, if they want to use carriers, let's say Hagelin Airlines or Hagelin Aviation, let's just say they, they agree to it, then they're receiving funds or proceeds from the marijuana business, and they have to claim that. Do they not? And then would that jeopardize, you know, their livelihood of loans and everything else? I mean, I've heard horror stories from various board members that, you know, banks want to just shut their accounts. So, I mean, are we doing the right thing by placing this burden or, you know, on the airlines? What? Through the chair. Uh, Mr. Miller. I mean, I, and I really don't know, yeah. so please answer. Yeah, and, and, I, and I would say this, that we're not placing a burden on anyone other than the industry because the industry has very limited options to transport through a state that has very limited transportation options. So I'm just considering why would we, why wouldn't we lift the burden off of the industry? And if there are some other small businesses throughout the state who want to work with the industry and who have the transport means necessary, give them the opportunity to, to do it. It's a, it's a business decision for them. It's a personal decision for them. So we're not burdening them. We can't make them do it. It's a choice they can make. But right now, they can't make that choice. That That's where I'm at. I mean, I, I can't go to Alaska Airlines and say, Marijuana Control Board said I could ship this in cargo. Here, you must take it. Right? I can't do that. But... There are plenty of other small businesses in the state who fly charter services who would be happy to take that product and transport it to wherever. And I, I marijuana think that, is, go ahead, I'm Mr. Sorry. Jaime, Mr. Jaime, I'll just say, uh, will the marijuana control board be notified of which businesses are doing this so that you know it's regulated in some fashion? Do we have a list of businesses um, that are participating? Uh, Mr. Jaime, I think we would learn that uh, from our director uh, and our enforcement staff 
is I believe the way, and again, stepping on Nick a little bit, uh, maybe also through the attorney, uh, what would happen is right now, uh, if you have uh, five pounds of button flour in your cultivator and you are selling that to uh, a retailer someplace, uh, you have all the batch numbers, uh, you enter those into metric that you're selling that product you're producing a travel manifest that says so-and-so is going to pick up this product from my business. They are going to immediately go to this other business and they're going to deliver that product. Uh, when that business receives it, they sign off on that manifest. They enter that information into metrics. So there is a trail that says it went from cultivator A to uh, retail business B uh, move from Fairbanks to Kenai, uh, the date, the time. So if we were to or get an access to operate the way Mr. Miller described, they would fill out the manifest, they would fill out the travel manifest, and they would say this product is going from uh, Fairbanks uh, to Bethel. Uh, it is going on this particular carrier. Uh, on these dates, on that date and that flight, and then the receiving in Bethel would fill out the, the metric that they received the product. If there was a discrepancy between that, uh, then AMCO would know about that because it would be in metric. It would operate the same way, except instead of having it personally with a person picks it up and a person, same person delivers it, uh, this would go through a carrier so we, in essence, would have that tracking through metric. Um, if I think that's the way I would envision that it would, would work, and so we would have that information without sort of having to have a separate list of which uh, carriers are willing to to provide that service. Uh, if you remember a couple of meetings back, we had an NOV or somebody that shipped something in cargo and you saw the tabs and stuff, and basically uh, that carrier was the one that questioned whether that should be done um, and could be done, and an NOV was issued. But that's how I would perceive how we would work this, and that would be to basically protect uh, people from having more contact and doing more travel than they otherwise would. Uh, because the air carrier or whatever carrier is going to go from point A to point B anyway, um, and this would just be more cargo. Uh, so, Mr. S uh, Miller, did I describe what I think you were envisioning correctly? And, and then to the attorney, uh, that would be something I guess I would ask you to research. Yeah, through the chair. Um, you, you, described it very, you described it very well. I would say the manifest is probably a little more detailed, um, you know, um, in information. Yeah, I, but other than that, it, it was a good description. Yeah, I, I'm not as familiar with what goes on in the manifest, although I've read some of them. They've been terribly confusing to me. But um, but anyway, I think that would be the process. So we would have that information, Mr. Jaime. Uh, Ms. Wilson is... Uh, I, I sort of like your suggestion if we could get things on the table that you could research and then we can mm -hmm. call a meeting soon. Uh, I know that may not be as quick as the industry would like, but um, we're, we're in a government that generally doesn't move very fast, even in an emergency. <laughs> and, you know, while you were speaking, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. No. Yes, yeah, Ms. Wilson. While you were speaking, I was reviewing 3 AAC 306750, your rules on transport, and I haven't yet seen the portion of it that would prevent what you're saying. So, one, I may not have seen it yet, but two, I'll have to look beyond your regu regulations to carriers as well. Um, and I will rely on Mr. Miller's expertise as much as he lets me. My question related to that is, do you think this is going to impact, impact um, growers trying to get their products tested, not being able to transport them to the lab. Uh, I, uh, to the uh, attorney, 
I, I believe so. Uh, it, it is a discussion that we had at an assembly meeting, uh, and I believe uh, Ms. Wilcox from the marijuana industry was at our assembly meeting. We did have that discussion. Uh, we were at that meeting when the governor put in the intrastate travel mandate, um, or the interstate, and uh, but not the intrastate. Um, and uh, but yes, it was uh, an area that she brought up at the assembly. We did have that discussion, um, and it is a problem uh, with getting. Uh, we do not have a manu edible manufacturer outside of a couple of products that Top Hat does in Juno. So all edibles have to come from outside Juno. Uh, but anything sold from Juno uh, to someplace else or even within Juno has to be tested. So it has to either go to Anchorage or Ketchikan, uh, both of which require air transport. Uh, so I think in the testing regulations, uh, the delivery process would have to be looked at as well. Through the chair, Mr. Miller, I, I I would agree with agree with you. I've been through these transportation regulations uh, twenty times, and the items we are talking about are not prohibited. I think the issue is is we require transporters to have a marijuana handler's card, and based mm. on that interpretation. Obviously, uh, Joe's cargo isn't going to have a marijuana handler's card. So I think we've kind of, you know, based on our interpretation of the regulations, that's where we got to, um, it had to be in yeah. the transporter's possession the entire time. I've, I've read that's, these regulations 50, 50 times over, and there's nothing in there that prohibits what we're talking about other than the marijuana handler's card. Well, and, and the fact that it has to be in possession the whole time, and uh, they can't say that if it goes from point A to point B with a third party that that isn't part of the manifest and doesn't have a marijuana handler's card. But I, I think I that's, would, again, okay. what the attorney could, could look at. And, and through, uh, through the chair this time, I completely support sending that, this question and this topic to the attorney. Okay. And through the, cha um, through the chair, this is also, I, I can request the governor to suspend portions of regulation. So it might be, you know, suspend the need that the, per that the individual be in possession and that the, they hold a manager handler permit. So there might be... Um, a quick relief for your for your licensees, and then if you have additional concerns about how to ensure the safety of the product getting from A, a to B, we can expand those in your regulations. Or the other thing that the marijuana, the alcohol board did is they gave, I think, Director Klinkhart some direct some authority to publish a guidance. And Director, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but. I thought that's what I heard about how to ensure that, for example, curbside um, pickup of alcohol wouldn't lead to uh, further harm to minors or um, the population at large. Uh, this is Director Klinkart. Uh, I'm sorry, but my, my brain is swimming on all the things that <laughs> we did the last hour of that meeting, and now we're going to yeah. have another on Wednesday. So I really I cannot speak to that at this point, and I apologize for that. Okay. Well, the three of us will get our brains together and listen to the tape. <laughs> it should go very quickly. Okay. Okay. Um, um, so uh, we have talked about curbside pickup. Uh, we have talked about transport. Um, was there any uh, other portion? I'm trying to remember what the marijuana industry asked us. Um, if I might here? just uh, pipe. Yes, who's that? Yeah, I'm sorry, this is Director Klinkart. Um, you talked about curbside. Okay. There was a requ two, two other things, um, and that was adjustment of, of enforcement priorities, which was also discussed during the ABC board meeting, uh, and um, delivery, uh, home home delivery. That's what I have on my list. Over. Okay, thank Through you. The chair. Through the uh, chair. Mr. Mr. Miller. Sorry, um, I had some more transportation issues I'd like to talk about, if possible, before okay. we get off this sure. topic. So one sure. of the issues 
I would like to talk about is, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about using what I would call transportation carriers. I, okay. I also wanted to talk about allowing handoffs of product. As an example, transporter A gets on a plane in Bethel or in Anchorage and he flies to Bethel. And yes. in, instead of leaving the airport and heading to town, he could hand that product off to an employee of said marijuana retail store and then immediately get back on the aircraft to leave town. That's not prohibited in our regulations um, that I could find, but somehow that's how where we've gotten to, and I'm not sure how. And I don't know if it's the way we've interpreted transportation and... Um, so I guess I'm looking for some guidance from the attorney. And if it is in regulation, I would ask that, um, as we're discussing this whole transportation thing, that we be able to hand off from one transporter to a next um, and have, you know, the secondary transporter get it to the finish line, if that makes sense. And in the end, okay. will the last recipient hold a marijuana handler card? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I would believe so. I, uh, I, I think that would be uh, another piece of the transport that I think the attorney can look at. I would just say that uh, one is we, we are uh, trying to protect the public, so uh, that's still a one-to-one -one transfer of, of persons. Uh, uh, the other issue I might have is, and one that, it's sort of been a bone of contention under some NOVs. Uh, you know, the immediately weighing in, uh, if the product's contaminated and the transporter's already back on the airplane and you have it in Bethel and you determine once you opened it that this is a uh, product that is uh, not good, you still have to enter it into your system and then waste it out as opposed to returning it, saying this uh, product is not acceptable to us. So uh, I think there's some issues there but that may be uh, going beyond what your concern is, and, and that will have to just be worked out with the industry that uh, you won't order from that vendor again if their product continues to show up and not be acceptable to you. But um, is there anything else, then, Mr. Miller, or anybody else related to transport that you would like the attorney to deal with? I, I, and <laughs> I'm sure I have more. Mr. Miller. Look at my list. I apologize. <laughs> Um, well, the list you, uh, list I, you I sent wanna, to me wasn't quite there. <laughs> and, and I guess I would say with that transfer thing we were just talking about, um, uh -huh. you know, uh, the handoff portion, that covers a lot of my concerns. One of the other ones I had was apparently, um, and, I ha and I haven't run up against this problem, but, but, uh, but companies from probably the southeast and others have, apparently we're not allowing overnight States, um, like an overnight, overnight holdover. Let's say if, you know, company A comes up to Anchorage from Juneau, um, has a bunch of deliveries in Anchorage, apparently based on something, it, and it might be uh, an interpretation, they can't stay in a hotel that night and get up the next day to go fair, to Fairbanks. If they have things in Fairbanks, they have to go directly there, which, you know, is, it seems like we're keeping people up maybe way past the hours that would be safe. But but I can't find the prohibition on that as well. So, uh, Mr. Miller, I think it's uh, one to go directly and that uh, unless city being transported, uh, marijuana must remain in a licensed premise. But I think what has happened here in Southeast, and I think sometimes in Kenai or maybe out to Kodiak, without enforcement here, uh, I'm not sure I get it right, but uh, a transporter would uh, find another marijuana business, say in Anchorage, uh, and store it there overnight while they went to a hotel, uh, and then would pick it up the next day. And that has happened several times 
and I think that was allowable. We had talked about that as a regulation to have, I forget the term, uh, it's almost like a, a, a holdover place so that, you know, if somebody from Fairbanks was going to Juneau and the flights got delayed, uh, you know, or something, they could have a place that they could uh, to go. And I, somebody else will come up with a better idea. And, and if the attorney and Director Klinkar talked to James Holsher, I'm sure that he would have the correct terminology. But that is something we had talked about before, and I don't think we've ever put that as part of a regulation. Uh, but I do believe it has to do with uh, the most expedited way and that uh, product not actively being transported uh, needed to be within a uh, licensed facility, and a hotel is not a licensed facility, and a hotel room is not a licensed facility. Uh, but but uh, that, that, again, I think the attorney can look at, and I, I agree with you. I think we need to address that because that's been a concern for quite a while with the industry. And, and Mr. Chair? Ms. Wilson. Uh, that is an issue that I actually see the argument could be made that that exposes the transporter to greater danger of COVID, um, con uh, contracting COVID because they're staying in a hotel overnight where that virus might be present. So I, I need your help in figuring out how that request is a response to the COVID emergency or if that's simply a separate regulations request. Through the okay. chair, can I make a comment or two? Mr. Miller. Um, I, I would say that if I was transporting marijuana from point A to point B, and based on just the amount of hours it takes to get from point A to point B, that if I drive halfway, stay in a hotel, and the marijuana stays in my possession, and then I get up the next morning and drive to Fairbanks, that marijuana was in transportation mode and it was really the most direct way to get there i i look at it yeah. as that's perfectly acceptable and i could you know uh, i'm looking for input from the board um <laughs> mr uh Ms. sorry yes mr jaime yeah you know that violates uh, and just using that example of driving let's say from kenai to fairbanks that completely violates help mandate 12 as far as community, community it, travel, I mean, it violates it. And I should make some clarifications here for Mr. Jaime, if that's okay. Sure, Mr. Miller. Under the health mandates, marijuana businesses under 20 employees are an essential business. The only thing that, well, it's not the only thing we have to do, but we have to file a health plan with the state and we have to file a travel plan with the state which I would say 95% of the businesses have done. And in one of the governor's um, press conferences, I think it was this week or last, they did say that marijuana businesses um, who meet the requirements of number 20 and can meet the health mandates are considered essential businesses. It didn't come from the governor itself. I don't remember the gentleman it came from, but they did actually say that and put it on the record. So we are considered... And, and then I believe Help Mandate 12 came out and superseded all of that. Uh, attachment, the, formerly Attachment A is what we're talking about, and that's the last one that came out. So um, I don't know if the attorney wants to comment on that, but... I honestly would, I mean, I think Mr. Jaime's raising a good point, and I haven't looked into the attachments to uh, make the argument you are making, Mr. Miller, but I can look into that. I don't know what preceded what and um, what carried over. You know, you know, and, and I agree. I, I thought I was very familiar with the health mandates, and I have never seen marijuana businesses with under 20 employees would be um, essential. Um, yeah, it's your job to I, know. You should just know that shit and research it before. Please, uh, we are not taking public testimony, uh, and we are struggling to be responsive to the industry. So please mute your phone. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
So uh, we will add that to the uh, issues that the attorney needs to review. Um, is there anything else on transportation? Mr. Chairman? Uh, Mr. Uh, Schulte. Yeah. Um, I'm not even sure this one is for the attorney. It may be just a, a really easy one. I, I, don't, I don't recall if this is something that AMA, AMIA brought up or if this was in the marijuana mailbox, but the concern was raised that uh, when a transport manifest is, uh, is entered, um, all of the specifics of the transportation are visible to both the, uh, the, the, the transporter and the recipient. And, and I think somebody was asking if, if some of those details or all those details could be obscured except from AMCO and the person doing the transportation. Um, I, I, I think it was raised as sort of a safety concern, not, not specific to the current circumstances, just a general one. So I was going to throw that out there and see if that's something that we have to do or if, we, if that's just something that could be turned off in metric to limit the uh, knowledge to people who have a need to know. Uh, if it's not COVID-related, I would like to have that discussion later. Uh, I don't think that is related to the, the COVID, but if, uh, uh, but no, I, I do think it's something that we should talk about uh, later. Is there uh, any other discussion on transportation that we feel is related, uh, changes we need that's related to COVID? Through the chair, Katie. Oh. Uh, if this is not a member of the board, the answer is no. <laughs> Mr. Yeah, Mr. Deshock. Um, uh, Mr. Deshock. Yeah, so uh, just the kind of a wrap up thought on the transportation thing, COVID related. Some of some of the stuff before us are things that I am uncertain whether or not they would benefit uh, industry, benefit consumers, benefit the public. But the transportation piece in this time, number one, I don't know what the level of business looks like, but the our local airlines are hurting. I would think that whatever, number one, if we're going to eventually streamline or if we're looking at moving towards this, uh, I think it's something that we should streamline because any business that we can get to the airlines is important, especially if you're not located directly on the road system. And number two, if it's something that, we, that we're looking at doing and we don't see any problem with it, um, through an emergency, through this order, the way that I understood it from the attorney, we're going to have a chance to review it later on in 120 days. So I, I don't think I would, I don't think that we as a board need to delay on the transportation issue. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, there were two other uh, issues. Uh, uh, enforcement priorities, I think, uh, Director Klinkhart can work on that. Uh, I don't know that that's necessarily a regulation as much as it is a plan, both for the protection of our own staff and uh, the providers. Uh, home delivery. Uh, is there any board member that wants to uh, discuss that particular option or have the attorney look at that particular option? Okay, hearing none, um, I guess what I would like to propose then um, is uh, we potentially like uh, the uh, alcohol board. Uh, would like to set a, another meeting in a week to uh, review what the attorney has done. Uh, and, and maybe I'm getting ahead of myself because it seemed like the alcohol board at least passed some motions, uh, maybe irrespective of whether the uh, attorney had done the review or, uh, so I guess just to back up a little bit here uh, is with, to the attorney, I guess, uh, would uh, we 
be able to formulate or with your help formulate a uh, motion uh, making that request to the governor and then you would fill in the details or should we ask you to do the research and have another meeting before we formally request any action from the governor? Well, let me uh, say this, Mr. Chair. It was a mutiny in the last half hour of the meeting. I was actually requesting the ability to research, but um, the board, through its authority and discretion, decided it wanted to recommend some provisions to the governor to suspend. They, they gave me a general outline of their concerns, and then what I have been doing in the meanwhile is looking up the general outlines of their concerns and then finding the regulation or statute that that uh, they want suspended and moving that up the line. So you could provide an advisory vote about what your concerns are for transportation and or curbside uh, pickup. At a certain point, um, Mr. Chair, your former counsel, Harriet Zinniger, was very kind to relay some additional questions, not related to regulations, but some issues she thought might be of interest to your board. So. Um, and to public health and safety. So if there's any time for me address, to address those with you, I'd like to do that too. Okay. Um, what's the wishes of the board? Should we, uh, uh, do you think we have sufficiently talked about curbside and transportation that uh, if we took a break for 10 minutes, uh, a member could come up with a motion or do you want to uh, ask the attorney to do uh, some research on this and we will schedule a meeting as quickly as possible uh, next week that we can notice the meeting uh, and uh, look at what the attorney has, uh, has found and go from there. Uh, what would be the preference of the board? Mr. Chairman, I, uh, Mr. Schulte. Mr. Schulte. I am. Um, I mean, I hate to continually punt stuff down the road, but I, I'm I'm thinking that having a week to come up with a, a well some well crafted language might behoove us because uh, I I mean, know the governor's got you know, the governor's office has a lot of stuff on their plate right now, um, and while it's super important to us, uh, I, I think the the more focus we can make the ask the better, and I think that having a week to prepare it would be ideal. And perhaps, okay. perhaps that could even be done in conjunction with, with legal counsel, so it's not all on her, on her plate. Okay. Um, any other board discussion? I concur with Mr. Schulte, Jaime. Okay. And uh, can I get... Mr. Miller? Can I ask clarification? Yeah, so when we're yeah. doing this, some of the things that we talked about aren't prohibited that I could find anywhere in regulation. Will we know which ones, let's just say the off-site handoff, right, that we talked about. Are we looking at that as, as okay, under the regulations it's not prohibited, so we just need to fix the interpretation of how it's been applied over the last couple years. So we don't have to ask for things that we don't really need, if that makes sense. It's things that we could do, right? Um, maybe three years ago, someone interpreted it and gave the direction that here's how you're going to transport. We look at the regs today. I couldn't find anything that prohibited an off-site handoff. So if, let's say, the, they go through the regulations and say, well, we can't find where it's prohibited, you know, based on board guidance, we can allow it to happen now. Is is that part of the plan? Uh, Mr. Miller, I think that would be part of what I think the uh, uh, attorney would look at. And, uh, you know, if she can't find where it's prohibited, uh, I think Mr. Klinkhart can talk to enforcement. Because uh, I, I remember this came up several times when I think uh, – Basically, a retailer in Kenai traveled all the way to Fairbanks and picked up product and then carried it back. Um, and we had sort of discouraged that at one point uh, through enforcement. Uh, they were rationale for that. Uh, but I do think that that should be part of what the attorney could come up with. And if it's not something we need to ask the governor, but it is something that we could do on our own, 
uh, I think she could let us know and then we could make a decision from that point. Does that make sense? I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, the, the Mr. Return Hyman. to what Mr. Lauren, oh, I'm sorry, what uh, Mr. Miller was saying, I think a lot of this has to do with like the point of sale, where it occurs, is it in a restricted area or is it on the curbside? So I think that's where the regulations pertain to, you know, what they can and can't do. It's the point oh, of sale has to be, I, you know, at the retail. Yeah. And at, at the, the retail point. level, yes, but but a, a sale from a cultivator to a manufacturer, uh, oh, yes. and who who delivers that? Uh, you know, we require a manifest from a cultivator that has to manifest and then walk through a door from the cultivation to their manufacturing, and then that that transfer gets taken place in person, and they hand uh, they do the metric. Uh, that's one thing, but if you're transporting from uh, Fairbanks to uh, Anchorage uh, and whether or not you can transfer that product from the cultivator's transporter to the manufacturer's transporter in the parking lot of Walmart, uh, I believe is one of the things that enforcement was not comfortable with, and so that's why we're at that position. But I think that's something the attorney needs to look at and give us advice. Yes, and I agree with you. I was looking at this Amendment A and uh, Health Amendment A12, and yeah, she just needs to look at it and interpret for us because my interpretation is different than Mr. Miller's. Right. So thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman? So, uh, Mr. Schulte. Sorry, I, I, I don't want to expand it. I actually kind of wanted to uh, wrap it up. Um, what I was going to suggest is perhaps Mr. Miller could come up with the uh, the bullet items that he thinks are going to be most impactful um, and maybe even take a first pass at determining which ones are actually changes in regulation requiring an emergency regulation and which ones would could potentially be viewed as just a change in enforcement or a change in interpretation. Um, then, then hand that off to legal counsel to review. Maybe, maybe that would be uh, a, a way to approach this. Yeah, I think Mr. Miller has a start on that, and I think the attorney had said that she was going to be in contact with Mr. Miller uh, based on okay, that. Great. Um, we also have the uh, testimony from AMIA uh, that we had yesterday. I believe they have also sent a letter to the governor. Uh, they have also sent a letter, I believe, to the board through the uh, director. I'm sure both of those uh, could be made available to the attorney um, and take a look. Um, so um, I guess the question is, before we totally wrap this up, uh, we sort of uh, haven't, don't have a motion. Um, would it be possible uh, for the board members and the attorney, and I guess the director, given staff and everything else with the alcohol board, uh, would it be possible to hold a meeting uh, on April 10th? That would be basically uh, one week from today. Would we be able to get the notice out? Would we be able to arrange for the uh, teleconference? And would uh, the attorney, given all of her other duties with the alcohol board, be in a position to respond to us on the 10th? This is Director Klinkart through the chair. Um, yes, um, uh, the fact that ABC is on, on Wednesday, this will be on Friday, I think I can spread the uh, resources appropriately. And would you want to do a full day or a half a day on Friday? Over. Uh, I think if we have just this, and depending on the information, I think we should look at a half day, uh, maybe a 9 to 12. Uh, if we go beyond that, that means we've gotten way too way into the weeds, mm -hmm. and we probably sure. can't make a good decision anyway. Through the chair. Uh, uh, Mr. Miller. I am unavailable from basically, I think, about 9 to noon on Friday. So we could do 1 to 4. That would work perfectly. Would you be available 1 to 4? Yes, sir. Uh, any other board members have any restrictions? Would 1 to 4 on Friday, April 10th work? Works for me. Okay. Hi, me. Works for me. Uh, Okay, uh, to the attorney, Ms. Wilson, uh, one to four on Friday, give you uh, uh, enough time? 
<laughs> yes. Something like it hurt. And um, we do have some guidance that with the uh, COVID-19 uh, disaster, we're trying at a minimum to give people 72 hours notice of a meeting, so we are well within range of that for purposes of complying with the Open Meetings Act. Okay. All right. Uh, so I will just take that as a consensus of the board uh, that we will try to reconvene uh, or establish another meeting on April 10th uh, from 1 to 4 uh, with the specific agenda item to deal with uh, the attorney's report related to curbside pickup uh, transportation uh, and uh, what uh, those results would be in terms of what might go to the governor versus what might uh, be a uh, regulation change that we want to look at down the road and or uh, just change in the uh, procedures that the staff use. Uh, if that's acceptable to the board, uh, we will leave it at that. Do I have any objections to that process? Okay, hearing none. Uh, Ms. Wilson, you said that um, uh, Ms. Milks had uh, given you uh, some suggestions on some other things. Um, do you want to raise those now and uh, at least list Certainly. them out? Thank you. Um, well, her initial, I, I don't necessarily think either of these issues are issues that require a, a regulation. Um, but she mentioned the concern, three safety concerns for the public. Uh, one is the number of transactions with cash and how cash is a source, how cash can carry the COVID um, virus for a lengthy period of time. Another is how many people um, retail licensees need to have in a store with checking IDs, et cetera. Uh, I don't know if, if if the licensees have still believe they can meet the security needs with a reduced staff. And the third is there's significant evidence that vaping and smoking um, impacts an individual's ability to fight off this virus. And I don't know if the board wants to weigh in on any of those issues, but um, those are the, the main ones. So if I could go back to the number of transactions uh, could you do, repeat that one again? Just in general, because of course this industry is cash based, cash is changing a lot of hands from the customer to the retailer. Um, and cash is a place where COVID can remain. I don't know if we know the, the actual length that can stay on that, but I don't know if there's anything, and this is more for you to consider whether there's anything, um, particularly retail establishments can do to ensure staff and customer safety when it comes to handling cash. Yeah, yes, I, I agree with you immensely, but we're also a, an industry that has trouble with banking and uh, credit card right. is oftentimes exactly. not available. I know most of the restaurants here in Juneau that are doing takeout um, are not accepting any payments in cash. They are credit card only. So if you only have cash. Uh, I know of people that have been turned down to purchase uh, delivery pizza because they were going to pay in cash and they will only take credit cards. So I'm not sure and that's realize, something we can. Yeah. yeah, I realize we can't change the law on that. I just don't know if anyone knows anything about sanitizing cash um, to make it safer for people. Yeah. And then the number of people that need to have in the store, I think that's part of the curbside discussion. And I believe that's something the industry has already. Uh, working on, as Mr. Miller said, uh, evidence of vaping and smoking to fight the virus. Um, while I probably agree, I think we're in the same boat as uh, tobacco industry and uh, e-cigarette industry that uh, we're not in a position of, of uh, overall regulating that. Um, and uh, so I'm not sure we can address that, that at all. Uh, but I, I have read the health mandates. So um, thank Ms. Mills, and I think that uh, maybe at some point we need to look at this if this virus goes on, but I, I don't know that we can do anything today or uh, in the next week on those. Is there any other board discussion? I'm sorry to, to break my own rules and talk for Mr. Chair? 
Uh, Mr. Director. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. D D Director oh. Klinkar? Yes. One thing I want you to at least consider that I, and I apologize for not making it on the agenda, is the uh, for the board to consider, uh, and this is an economic consideration, so I want to make sure you know that, of um, licensing fees for uh, marijuana during this pandemic. You may discuss. Over. Uh, yes, I, uh, yeah. Oh, there's a can of worms. Yeah, uh, it, it is, and 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 there are there are regulations and laws that the governor has done in terms of occupational licensing fees. Uh, you know, if a hairdresser has been shut down and their license is up for renewal, then they don't have an income to pay the fee to renew their their license. Um, and uh, but since all of our industry is still operating. Uh, I don't think we fit in the same way a hairdresser or masseuse uh, does. Uh, it, at some point in time, there was a list of all of the various departments and the regulations and laws that, that have been suspended within the Department of Commerce where we are. Uh, there was only two listed, and none of those had anything to do with 3AAC or with uh, 1738. So um, I, I think that... Uh, Mr. Klinkart is right. I think that's something we have to pay attention to. And if it was a point where uh, somehow there was a requirement or some mandate to shut down all or portions of our industry and we're coming up on renewal time, then yes, I think we do that. At the same time, we have to remember that we as a board and our ability to function with staff depend on those fees and that if we get to that point, that we could be a real diminished response to the industry. So um, I hope we never get there, but I also understand it is an economic thing for the industry, and we do need to pay attention. Through the chair. Mr. Miller. I, I would just say as an industry member, um, as long as our business is open, I, I don't know why we would um, suspend the fees or, or whatever we're talking about. And, and yeah. I know we took I knew we took some action on marijuana handler card renewals, but um, I would say if this goes too long, that maybe at some point uh, the board come back and consider um, you know waiving the marijuana handler uh, renewal fees for individuals, not necessarily businesses, but um, you know not all. Not all marijuana handle card people are working right now, and I would hate to see someone's card expire because they couldn't afford um, to renew it. I think the renewal fee may be less than the uh, fee to pay for the education that we require, but uh, I, I do get your point, Mr. Miller, and I think we'll, we need to keep that in our mind as well. Okay, so we are down to our, we are done with, uh, I guess, the proposed regulations consideration of emergency delegation. Is there anything else on that, those two subjects that we've been discussing that we need to continue on? Okay, hearing none, um, and I, I will admit that I have not read the marijuana mailbox, but is there anything that people have read in the marijuana mailbox other than the one Mr. Schulte brought up um, uh, that we uh, people want to highlight? I, I have a comment. Uh, who's this? And this is Sam Hansen. Uh, we're not taking any public comment at this Thank time, Ms. Hansen. You're Thank welcome. You. Um, from the board, is there anything in the marijuana mailbox? Okay, I, I would, none. I, Oh, sorry. Mr. Miller. Um, I don't know, and Mr. Jones, I know you'll get an opportunity to read the uh, mailbox. You always do. But I am surprised. I see a lot of, uh, I guess, comments about taxes and um, people being behind or not paying them. And uh, I would say the public and maybe the industry themselves feel like this board isn't taking action and 
I would encourage the other members of the board, if they haven't already, to read the marijuana mailbox because there's also a few other emails um, about some other situations. And I just feel like, you know, we need to focus on that to make sure that the public has confidence that we're doing what we should be doing. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, me. Mr. Hammy. Yeah, just to comment on the same, same thing that uh, Mr. Miller just mentioned. Uh, this was our number one priority that we forwarded to the governor's office. I don't know how much we can actually do. We're aware of the problem. So. Uh, thank you. I, I, I think I would make a suggestion. Of, we have had a couple of meetings before, but uh, staff have changed. Uh, perhaps in the June meeting, uh, depending on our other business, or maybe it's important enough to bring to our business, if between now and June, uh, the director uh, and Ms. Wilson could meet with Department of Revenue Taxation, uh, determine what the issues are between communication, notification, uh, confidentiality, and then perhaps uh, have somebody from the tax division come to our June meeting to talk to the board uh, and uh, talk about the communication system that may or may not be possible based on the discussions with the attorney. I know we've had them in the past and they say they're prohibited from telling us directly. Uh, so every month or three months we get a list of who's defend, who's delinquent. If their name's not on there, you know they've paid their bills or they're current with the payment plan. Uh, but we oftentimes don't know that. So we may see it one month and not see it another and assume that it's okay when in fact it's not because they're not compliant with a payment plan. So uh, the DNR, uh, Department of Revenue and the tax division have some pretty substantial confidentiality rules. Uh, like I know in the city, I can be told that uh, a company's behind in their sales tax and that gets actually made public. But at the same time, everybody who's compliant I don't know what they pay because I could back uh, do the math and figure out what their total sales were. So parts of that is confidential, parts not. So I guess I would ask uh, for the June meeting, since I think this is an important subject and we have at least two new board members that have not been through those discussions with Revenue before, that the director and the attorney uh, meet with Department of Revenue Taxation, uh, figure out what how we can better communicate so we can meet some of those requirements that I think people want us to meet and what those rules are and then uh, bring that to the June meeting with a DNR rep uh, so that the board can be educated and uh, uh, go from there. Is, is that okay with people? Yeah. But, Mr. Chairman? Okay. Yes, Mr. Schultz. I, uh, yeah, just, you know, in the course of this conversation, we kind of, we were, briefly addressing two issues. One is the, the amount of tax applied at the state level, and, and Mr. Jaime is correct. We've, we've put the request out there to the legislature. That's about all we can do on that front. But right. uh, a lot of the concerns raised in the marijuana mailbox were simply that, you know, by not, by not holding people accountable, licensees accountable for this, they're able to essentially function at a, you know, 20 to 30 percent greater profit margin than their competition. And the others can't compete, and and I I do think we owe them, we owe them a duty. The others a duty to to hold folks' feet to the fire. And you know, in the past, I think we've been a little bit um, lenient because you know we wanted individual licensees to succeed. And uh, I I'm not sure that that's really good for the industry as a whole. And I th I think if we start holding people's feet to the fire and holding their license. Uh, in the balance, maybe people will understand that if they're going to play in this game, if they're, if they're going to compete fairly in a, a regulated, lawful market, they're going to pay their taxes or they're out. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I don't disagree. But Good one, since state taxes are. Who, who was just talking? I think that was an editorial comment. Uh, I thought so too. Uh, I think the other consideration that we've always done when we've talked about taxes and licensing fees is one, this is at the cultivation level. And so if we close a business down, 
um, until they get taxed, and we've committed a seizure in place, and we've got all kinds of rules around seizures. Uh, if we put a business out of business, uh, then uh, we have to have a, a method to destroy the, the product, uh, and then the state's not going to collect any tax because they're not earning any income. So that's the other side that I think this board has weighed in on at various times. Um, and what, since, you know, we're basically, uh, if we shut down a retailer or a product manufacturer, there's, there's different issues there, but for a uh, cultivator, uh, we have some, some other issues. Uh, and I don't disagree. I know for a business in Juneau, uh, that's delinquent on sales taxes. It might take the city two years before they end up in court. And that business is still open and people still go there and people still pay the sales tax and none of that gets paid to the city. Uh, so, uh, I don't have an answer for you, Mr. Schulte, but, uh, maybe that's some of the questions that we can ask in, in June. Uh, about exactly what we can do because revenue's got some enforcement. They can go in and do some things too. But in our regulations, keeping your license is dependent on your uh, status with paying taxes. So uh, we do have to honor that. Um, okay, so um, is there anything uh, else related to the mailbox? Okay, um, I had one issue that I said I wanted to bring up uh, when we talked about the agenda. Um, and uh, so uh, in all fairness to Mr. Klinkhart, I'll put him on the spot, but um, I had heard a discussion um, around about that uh, there was a limited cultivator uh, that had uh, doubled their production uh, by various means uh, had a significant number of untagged plants when investigators went there. Um, and Mr. Klinkhart had mentioned that an NOV was done uh, and that uh, he had been trying to work on a process to uh, uh, address that issue uh, and that the NOV would be in our packet. And I did not see the NOV in our packet. And I was wondering if, if uh, Mr. Klinkhart could provide to the board uh, a discussion about uh, that particular NOV and the action or act, non, non, whatever actions the director took um, that uh, has yet to be uh, discussed or presented to the board. Hi, this is Director Klinkhart. At least, at least now I know which one you were speaking of. Thank you, Chairman. You're welcome. Uh, and I will also probably be inviting um, uh, Jana to, 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 to chime in. But yes, that, that particular case is one that uh, started off as a potential serious issue with a licensee that was doing several things, including layering and doubling, in some cases maybe tripling their, their uh, space of growth. Um, investigators actually uh, were sent out. They, did, they actually went out, I think, a couple times. We began the process then of actually working with the licensee, and there were, of course, things are not always black and white. The more we looked into it, we discovered we actually had a, an owner who was unaware of certain things, and when brought to their attention, they jumped on it. They came forth. We talked to them. We are now working. Uh, they also had some things they had to do because of fire code, which um, also concerned them. And so long and short of is right now, uh, we're still uh, waiting for the fire, I think the fire uh, marshal to approve things, but it looks like with, um, with help uh, from, from the folks, from enforcement, that we're working this whole process through. And I think they're probably, I think this particular owner understands there would probably be a fine, but I think we're going to be able to come to something that works for everybody. Um, Janet, do you have something you want to add to this particular uh, incident and how we handled it? No, I think I think that captures it. I mean, I think this is a, a good learning experience for the licensee, and he knows that there's some responsibility he's going to have to accept, and probably in the form of a fine for um, not keeping a closer eye on how people were structuring the grow, and he just didn't understand he couldn't be vertical, and so he's killed all the extra plants um, per and working with enforcement, keeping enforcement up to date. Um, every step of the way, and I, I believe he's actually obtained fire marshal um, approval. I have to look back, but I think he did, and I think I've, I think I've, I've updated enforcement on that. But I'll have to double check 
Um, so yeah, we we're just um, you know waiting for enforcement to you know discuss you know the penalty because because we're sure there will be one. Are we still on? Sorry, this is Director Clink. Oh, sorry. Just want to I wasn't on mute. I'm sorry. The whole time, right? I'm sorry. I was I was on mute. I oh, okay. apologize. Oh. Okay. Um, I think that's the the point that uh, is well seen raised and you raised that the owner uh, is going to know that they're going to have to pay a fine. Um, I my interpretation of the rules is that an NOV is issued. Uh, the board is informed of that NOV. We are allowed to act on that NOV. Uh, we can find somebody on that NOV. If there is what is deemed to be, uh, I guess, an egregious, then um, an accusation is made uh, that starts a, a series of uh, their right to have an informal discussion uh, with uh, the director. And if there's a result out of that, that could report back to us. Otherwise, there is a hearing. And through that hearing, uh, we can uh, also issue a fine. Um, and this process seems to be a little out of joint with that, where you as a director are negotiating uh, related to a violation that the board doesn't know about, uh, negotiating maybe a fine level that the board has not necessarily known about or agreed with. Um, and, and so I just, I, I think on this particular one, uh, the process has gotten a little bit out of order. Uh, and uh, so I just, I wanted to, to bring it up um, and uh, uh, maybe other board members have some questions about it. Uh, but it seems like this is a pretty far down the road negotiations involving the office and an attorney that may Do have some. Uh, no, okay. it's well seen. I just wanted to clarify because uh, I think maybe I no, didn't see the picture correctly. Well, I think that's that's part of the contention is that I don't think this is following the process we have generally used, and so uh, uh, the fact that you can tell us what kind of process is going on and and uh, uh, bothers me no end. But <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I was just wondering if any other board members had any. A particular comment, and maybe uh, um, maybe I'm uh, I'm off base. Uh, Objection! Who is like she representing proceed. right now? Objection! Who is she representing? Uh, she is representing the the uh, business that we're talking about that we are not naming, uh, and uh, uh, she was asked to elaborate by the director, and after that, I have not allowed her to talk. So, uh, please. Uh, uh, listen and uh, uh, let us do our business. Is there any other board member that has uh, any comments or concerns uh, related to this topic? To the chair. To the chair, the sign me. It sounds like you're here. Miller. Good. Oh, sorry, uh, Mr. Mr. Hi, may I cut you off again? <laughs> oh, yeah, Mr. Mr. Hyme, let's start with yeah. you. No, I just said it. I mean, uh, you hit all the main points, and I'm good with all your comments. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Miller. I don't. I have very strong feelings about this, and I, I want to make sure that the director understands that the board has the authority to impose fines and penalties, and nothing should be negotiated with a licensee or their attorney. Um, this is very concerning to me, and I'm disappointed that. The board doesn't know what's going on, and you know, I, I would sh I would speak very strongly that if you have questions about how these issues should be handled, speak to you know uh, our legal advisor. That's what she's there for. This this is just you know we try to hand down decisions as a board to be fair based on what we've done in the past and how we've handled other licensees. And to have anything negotiated outside that, you know, I, I just can't tolerate it. And as a board member, I, I feel like 
you know, we're losing a little bit of authority here, and I don't know if that's the intent, but um, I am definitely not happy about it. This is um, Ms. Wilson. I am looking, I thought, I, Glenn, I can't recall if we talked about this, but I know I thought Jana was exercising the informal conference authority for the purposes of that meeting. Um, perhaps she could state what she was trying um, to say. Through the chair. Please, Ms. Wilson, in answer to Ms. Wilson's question only. Uh, um, through the chair to Ms. Wilson, I think what you're thinking of is a different license um, because we haven't even gotten an NOV for this particular license that we're discussing. And so there hasn't been an opportunity to even use that mechanism. I was just saying I anticipated that once enforcement got to go back in and, and it's going to take enforcement time to draft up their NOV because there was a couple of things that were incorrect in the facility that they need to cite by violations for, I assume, that I was just anticipating that we would get a fine for that. I didn't say the director was negotiating a fine. We've never even talked about a fine number with the director. So is it still in enforcement? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's, still, it, it's completely still in enforcement. They, they haven't issued the NOV yet. And I hear the board's concern that they want to caution us not to in any pre-NOV negotiations, and you're saying that has not occurred. That has not occurred, no. But the board is also, well, I, I want to make sure I can properly advise the director, because I, I don't want well, him being um, chastised if I'm the source of the problem. Well, what I, what, I, what I have heard was that there was an NOV issued, uh, and there was an accusation drafted, but uh, I will leave that to the director and the attorney to work out, but I just wanted the board to be aware that I had heard of this situation. I'd had a conversation with, with the director, uh, and that uh, uh, I just think we're outside of a process uh, that is fair to uh, the uh, business owners uh, because we have set up a process by which the board uh, does that and. Uh, like his direction, and we've gone to a point where it's, I think, gone a long, pretty long ways uh, without an NOV. So uh, I will leave it at that. I will hope that the attorney and the director can figure out where we're at in the process and get us back in line with uh, the way our regulations read that involves the board uh, in what appears to be a pretty significant violation. Uh, and I will just leave it at that unless there's some other board member that wants to weigh in. Okay, hearing none, um, I, before we get to board comments, I would just uh, reiterate that our next meeting will be a single topic to talk about uh, some of the uh, emergency regulations or laws that we want to either deal with or approach the governor on. That meeting will be on uh, April 10th. Uh, by teleconference from 1 to 4, uh, and we will have a report from uh, the attorney, and uh, I know she will reach out to Mr. Miller so that we uh, have ad adequately covered those issues. Um, and then our next regularly scheduled meeting uh, will be June 10th and 11th, 2020. At this time, it is scheduled to be in Fairbanks, that will be depending on the travel mandate, the health mandates, the emergency orders. Uh, we may well be back here uh, at uh, a teleconference again. Uh, so with that, um, we will start with uh, board comments. And I will put you in an owner's position, Mr. Deshuk, uh by calling on you first. Uh, but before you uh, have any board comments, I did appreciate uh, you during this meeting. It appears to me that you have been studying uh, the issue, and I was uh, uh, very appreciative of, of your attention to that and your comments on your first meeting and to do it in such a manner with a teleconference. It uh, was really appreciated. But if you have any comments, Mr. Deshook, please. Just. Uh Thanks for the meeting, uh, and I am glad to be on the board. I think that we did a good job of addressing things during this time, and also for the 
just to reiterate what I said at one point, because I think it's so important in the emergency, as we go through this stuff and going into next week and we're thinking about it over the next week, I think it's a good time to look at regulations of which we may at some point want to change anyway and to avoid doing things that we are doing that we are going to want to rescind when when this time is passed. But other than that, I appreciate it. Thanks for being helpful, and that's all I've got. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Heine. Well, there I am. I was on mute. I uh, just want to – I'll keep my comments really short. I just want to thank the staff, and thank you, Mr. Jones, for leading this board. I think you kept us on topic and got us through uh, these 66 tabs pretty fast. Uh, and I want to thank Mr. Glinkart, our director, also – uh, you know, he's new to the position. He's only been here four months. There's a lot to learn. And he doesn't know all the processes. So I hope you didn't feel like you jumped on you at the end. But so I think you're doing an outstanding job. So thank you. Uh, that's it. Okay. Uh, Mr. Schulte. Yeah, I just, uh, well, I'd like to uh, thank the, the director and the staff. I know they are working super hard, and that is much appreciated. And uh, Ms. Wilson also. Uh, I'd like to welcome Mr. Deshock to the board. Uh, it's been great uh, working with you today, and hopefully uh, we'll get to do it in person at some point. Um, and uh, to the industry, um, you know, best of luck to you guys. We're doing what we can. We're not always going to hit it right, but um, we're, we're doing our best. Okay. Uh, Mr. Miller. Um, as every meeting, I, I do appreciate everything the staff has done. I mean, for a teleconference, I think this was probably more efficient than our last three in-person meetings. And um, thank you, Mr. Jones, for keeping us on task. We I can't believe we made it through the agenda and had time to have a couple hour discussion about the situation we're in today as a state. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Deshaun, uh, I appreciated your questions. It's good that you, like Mr. Jones said, you have really read up and got yourself educated and I appreciate that. You were much farther ahead than when I first got on the board. And uh, Mr. Jaime, I will quit trying to cut you off. So that's uh, I'll give you a little. I'll give you an extra two second uh, head start on the on the phone and the comments. Sounds okay. Uh, all right. Then my my comments will echo a lot of uh, others. I really am appreciative of the staff and the work that they did. Uh, I will also compliment the industry uh, for a couple of comments here at the end. I think for a teleconference that has been about. Uh, nine or ten hours, um, we have a lot less back noise and a lot less uh, talking over. It has made our job on the board with this trying time uh, much easier, and I really do appreciate those who uh, listened in and who uh, were available to participate when they were called on. Uh, it really did help us, uh, and uh, hopefully I was able to... Uh, Call on people, not cut people off. It's very difficult when you can't see people face to face and uh, uh, stuff. And uh, I have learned over many years in government, we're holding meetings on the telephone that uh, it does take a separate process, thought process on whoever's chairing it to make sure that they include everybody. And I hopefully um, I have done that today. Um, and I'm really appreciative to uh, Ms. Wilson and to uh, the, the staff uh, and uh, to uh, make sure that we have everything down. Uh, and uh, with that, um, is there any other business to come before the Marijuana Control Board? Okay, hearing none, uh, I am going to adjourn this meeting at uh, 3 uh, 27 p.m. on the 3rd of April, 2020, and we will convene in a special called session uh, April 10th at 1 o'clock. Uh, so thank you all, and uh, uh, we are done for the day. Talk to you all later. Bye. Iris is a hoax. Iris is a hoax. It's all about saving children from being rescued. It's all about human trafficking. This is all fake. I want to know. 5G is, has nothing to do with this. The president is doing a great job. He's saving people while we're all asleep and away at our homes. So everyone just bunker down.
down. The chairperson has disconnected. The conference will now end.